Hello, I'm State Representative Mike DeVilla from the 7th House District. Welcome to Ohio In Focus. Hello and welcome to this edition of Ohio in Focus, a program that brings state government to you. I'm Brad Miller and I'm joined today by State Representative Mike DeVilla, who serves the 7th House District, which includes portions of Cuyahoga County. Representative, good to have you on the show again. Thanks very much. Good to be back. Um, so we're at the beginning stages of uh, the 131st General Assembly. Um, some changes, namely uh, the election of a new uh, House Speaker, Cliff Rosenberger. One of his first tasks as Speaker is uh, appointing members of the Republican Caucus to committees. Uh, we'll start with uh, some of your committees, beginning with finance. Can you tell us uh, your work on that committee? Absolutely. Well, it's good to be back on finance for a second term in a row. And of course, we're um, uh, just during this show taking a little break from uh, what's going on a couple floors up from here as the second day of that process gets underway on the governor's budget, which was uh, sent up to, to us on Monday. Uh, but also serving on some other committees then as well this time. I've shifted from Higher Education Subcommittee of Finance over to Transportation, uh, which is an important uh, issue area for our part of the state, certainly in Greater Cleveland, um, as we're watching the second span of, of the Voinovich Bridge being built. Uh, also serving on the, the full Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, as well as over on the Ohio Turnpike and Infrastructure Commission. So we'll be uh, still neck deep in transportation issues over the course of this session. Uh, and then I'm new on public utilities this time around, which should leverage some of my background in uh, the energy area from work out in the private sector a number of years ago, and then also serving on financial institutions, housing and urban development, which is a new committee for me as well this time. So you've uh, touched on uh, some of the things, particularly transportation, and you mentioned uh, some of the projects in your district. Um, a lot of times you can learn a lot about a, uh, a member of the House based on what committees they serve on. So specifically, uh, what might be some other examples um, based on your background and experience uh, that correspond to the needs of your district? Well, transportation is certainly an important er issue area for, uh, for Greater Cleveland and for our district in the southwest part of the county. Um, I was just mentioning uh, in the finance hearing today to ODOT Director Ray that the turnpike runs through every community in the district that I represent. Uh, all of the cities and, and Olmsted Township as well, which is our one township in that section of the county. And we've worked really hard over the last number of years to try and address how the turnpike has had an impact on our communities. Uh, with the addition of the third lane a number of years ago in the late 1990s and into the early 2000s, um, it's had an impact on the communities that surround the road, particularly in the way of noise. So we've been working on a, what is now in place as the really the first general revenue fund dollars to flow into the turnpike uh, for mitigation projects. And those might be related to, to noise issues in the communities, uh, roadways that have been impacted by the presence of the turnpike, and also uh, drainage, which has been an important uh, issue really for a, a big section of Cuyahoga County, but particularly around, uh, around the road. So. Uh, that really is an important thing we've tried to address the last few years here, and I think we're starting to make some progress on that. A number of our communities did go ahead and put in applications a couple of years ago for that new program. Uh, so you serve on four committees, one subcommittee. Can you just briefly explain um, Transportation Subcommittee on Finance mm -hmm. and the Transportation and Infrastructure Standing Committee? Just briefly talk about what the difference between those two are. Sure. So the subcommittees of the Finance Committee will really take different portions of the budget as it comes from the executive over to the legislature. And a lot of folks may not realize that we actually engage in four main budgets that occur in the odd numbered year. We'll start with industrial commission and workers comp and transportation. And then the main operating budget will move a little bit later into the winter and spring. And then often in the even numbered year, we'll see a fifth budget come through which addresses capital projects. Um, we did one of those just last year, and that was the first time in six years that we went ahead and, and had a major capital budget as the economy began to improve. But within Transportation Subcommittee then, we'll take a look at that specific component of the budget that's arrived here and uh, work through the process of having the different agencies that are impacted come in. 
uh, we've heard in full finance today, for example, from uh, public safety, transportation, and the, the Turnpike Commission. And we'll hear from all of them again at the subcommittee level. And the subcommittees are quite small. They only have five members on them as opposed to 32 who serve on full finance, which is nearly a third of the House. And as a result of that, you really get an opportunity to dig in deep on the issues that are important to you and that, um, that are brought before those subcommittees. So besides your uh, committee appointments, you've also taken on uh, another new title here uh, in the House during uh, this General Assembly, and that is the title of House Majority Whip. Can you tell us what that job entails? I can. Well, it's one of the leadership positions here in the House. Um, a lot of folks have joked with me over the last uh, number of weeks here because they know the title maybe from House of Cards right. here recently. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't pushed anybody in okay. front of a metro train or anything like that. Good. But uh, it's uh, an interesting role, and, and the old... Uh, the old concept really comes from the British Parliament, where the, the whips would be assigned to uh, get the votes all in place and make sure that uh, that the votes were there that were were needed to get a bill passed. We really do the same thing here in the legislature. So we have uh, a pretty sizable supermajority this time, 65 members. It's the largest for uh, either party since one person, one vote went into place in the late 1960s. And so my job is to work with our members and to get input from uh, all of our folks around the caucus. And, uh, and then ultimately when a bill comes to the floor, make sure that the votes are there to ensure passage. So it's safe to assume that you will not be pushing anyone from the train switch. <laughs> I will not be doing that. that. So going. That's the, the old British version of the show is quite interesting as well, though. I just had a chance to go back and check that out also. Uh, so you talked about the job. What do you foresee being uh, some challenges that might come down the pike with this position? Well, you know, we're, we're a diverse state. Uh, I point out often that, you know, 11 and a half million people were the seventh largest state in the country. And uh, one of the, the most important parts of this role, I think, is to help kind of draw people from diverse backgrounds together around the state. I represent a suburban district, uh, which is a little bit rare these days when you look at most of the state geographically is rural. Uh, and then we have highly concentrated urban areas where a number of our representatives come from. And then uh, so there's kind of the link between all of those to make sure that uh, competing interests are, are dealt with in a way that uh, engender some compromise. Uh, folks have to give uh, on both sides of the aisle and, and within the caucus. Uh, but one of the challenges of having a, a caucus of this size with a, a supermajority is it becomes a little more difficult to wrangle everyone and, and get folks on the same page or at least into a, a position where they can agree on a bill as it comes to the floor. So that could be a challenge as we get through this. But folks are getting along very well as we start the session here. And our leadership team has worked really hard to make sure that we're communicating with folks and getting as much input as we can. And it's, it's more a process of listening than, uh, than putting information out. Right. Um, one piece of uh, legislation or topic that uh, you've been very active on is uh, charter school reform. Um, can garner some strong opinions on both sides. Uh, and this is very early in the, the process, so uh, we obviously won't get into this too deeply. But um, before we begin, there's a lot of uh, entities that go into school choice or educational options here in Ohio. So uh, before we get into what you're working on, can you just explain to the viewers so we're all on the same page what we're talking about when we use the term charter school? Sure. Well, in, in statute, they're referred to as community schools. It's one option that exists outside of the traditional public schools that folks are familiar with and that many of us attended. I was K through 12 in the Berea system, for example. Um, that's one of the 611, 612, depending on how you count, school districts around the state today. This is one option that's outside of that, um, which should also be noted along with um, homeschooling, private schools, um, different types of scholarship options that occur uh, even within uh, the traditional public process. Um, so today we've got about 120,000 students who are enrolled in, uh, in a couple hundred uh, of, of these community schools around the state. Um, so what are some of the broad overarching themes that you have seen in working on this issue uh, that you feel need to be worked on in order to secure uh, substantial reform to this system? Sure. It's, um, well, I would note at the beginning that um, I'm personally a supporter of school choice. I know uh, many of our members here in the legislature on, on both sides of the aisle are. Um, so this bill that we've introduced, House Bill 2, um, is not designed to be a witch hunt of, of community schools here in the state at all. But we do know, as we've watched their performance since this form of school was established back in the 1998-1999 school year, 
uh, that the performance has been uneven. Uh, some of these schools do quite well and others uh, are, are struggling a little bit more. Our bill, which I'm uh, sponsoring with Representative Rogner from, uh, from Hudson down in Summit County, is designed to really address three main areas. Um, the first is accountability, uh, the second is transparency, and the third is responsibility. Um, and really that last area is related to some existing conflicts of interest that are in, in the law or in practice right now. Um, so you are working on a bill. How, what are some of the things that need to be done uh, generally to secure uh, success in those three areas? Well, you know, we've we found that in, in some cases where uh, community schools are not performing well, they're able to move from one sponsor to another. Sponsor hopping is what it's called. Uh, one of the provisions in our bill will prevent that from happening. Um, there's another provision related to accountability that makes sure that the standards that are applied on the state report card for our, uh, our traditional public schools are also applied to uh, community schools. So really just instilling more of those kind of things in the process um, within the responsibility area. Um, there's an issue where folks are able to serve uh, on a board or in some capacity within a community school and then also perhaps have their company uh, sell services to the school. And so there's a connection that, while it might not be unethical, could have the appearance of impropriety at least, um, or could be worse. And so we want to make sure that we're addressing those things in the law. Uh, we'll move on. We have a few minutes left um, to our final topic. Invariably, every General Assembly you have bills that are introduced, vetted, debated in committee, sometimes even passed by one chamber or another, the House or Senate, uh, but that just don't get signed into law. Um, you have already reintroduced some legislation that you've worked uh, very closely with during the last uh, GA, so we'll touch on just a couple of those. Sure. Uh, we'll start with the Elder Justice Act, which you worked on with uh, Representative uh, Wes Rutherford from the Southwest Ohio area. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what this bill hopes to accomplish? Sure, so this was House Bill 49 in the last session, and actually we had introduced it late in the previous session as House Bill 572, for, so for viewers who wanna go ahead and look up those bills and how that process went in the past two sessions, those are the bill numbers. Um, it's the Ohio Elder Justice Act, and it's, it's really follow-on legislation that builds on some work that I was engaged in during my first term as a result of work with um, our senior director in Olmsted Falls. And I, I went to her fairly early on and said, you know, what can we do to draw greater attention to, to elder issues? And she asked us to help designate a day in June of each year, it's June 15th, as Elder Abuse Awareness Day. It had been done at the international level through the United Nations, and so we did that at the state level during my first term. And I, I told Kathy at that point that this was a down payment on what we wanted to get done in terms of substantive change. So House Bill 49, um, and we've now just reintroduced it, and I think it's House Bill 24 in this new session, uh, will do a number of things to tighten down adult protective service law in the state, provide for additional mandatory reporters, uh, within banks and financial institutions. One of the things we're finding today is that cases of elder abuse aren't simply related to physical abuse by a family member or in a nursing facility, but they're related now to financial exploitation. As uh, an unscrupulous individual may call uh, one of our senior citizens and uh, attempt to bilk them out of some, some personal money through a process uh, on the telephone or on the internet or what have you, and so this bill will really tighten down uh, some of those mandatory reporting provisions that are in law so we can help protect some of our most vulnerable citizens. Uh, and the other bill we're going to talk about is uh, known as Open Ohio, which if it had to be boiled down into one word, I think would, that word would probably be uh, transparency. That's right. Uh, can you tell us about this bill? Sure. So this was um, House Bill 175 in the last session. Um, I think it's being dropped either today or tomorrow here in session and we'll get a new bill number as we go forward. We got this bill through the House last time as we did with, with 49 in the previous session and um, we'll work with our friends in the Senate to make sure these bills get all the way through the process as, as we work through the 131st. But the idea behind this bill is to provide an online transparent database that provides greater accountability for how we spend taxpayer money at the state level. Um, Treasurer Josh Mandel has already gone ahead uh, through the auspices of his office and set up what I think is perhaps the best online transparency database in the country at uh, ohiocheckbook.com. And so viewers can check that out. But it's a really cool um, online website now where people can plug in um, any state agency, any state expenditure, and drill down all the way to the level of the actual expense, the check itself, and determine um, who the payee was, how much it was for, what it was, was spent for. 
and, um, and then also compare within agencies. So you can see if transportation spending X for a pack of pencils, you can go over and see what Department of Administrative Services is doing uh, for, for the same type of purchase. So it allows within agency and then across agency so that there's a good apples to apples comparison of how tax dollars are being spent. I think it's just a great way to put folks in a position as regular citizens where they can be auditors for the state in addition to the great work that is done here in the legislature and within our state agencies. It's another example or effort for uh, uh, open government. Exactly. Um, we have about a minute left. Um, say a constituent in your 7th House District wants to uh, share with you an idea or a concern, what's the best way uh, for them to get a hold of you here in the State House? Well, there are a couple of ways. Um, they can call uh, my senior legislative aide. His name is Bill White in our office, and our number is 614-466-4895. Uh, for folks who prefer to send something by email, they can send that over to uh, rep07, rep07, at ohiohouse.gov. And that information is on the screen. We're out of time. Representative, always a pleasure. Good to see you today. Thanks for sitting down with us. And we look forward to seeing you again on the next edition of Ohio in Focus, a program that brings state government to you. Thanks for watching.